If I want to make my students really think about the Cold War, I have a few questions I like to put to them. And one of them is what happens if Joseph Stalin doesn't die in 1953? What happens if he dies in 1956? If he lives to the Suez Crisis? What happens? He's not an old man. He's not a young man, but he's not so old that, frankly, he couldn't live a bit longer. He's 74 when he dies. This has had a hard life, but... Making it to 78? 80? He wouldn't be really challenged. Let's be honest, there's no one who dare challenge him at that point. And what happens in the world? Usually, they start off by thinking purely about the political, the international relations connotations, the events that could have happened and would have maybe not happened with him at its head. And then they also start to think about what the leadership would be like afterwards. It takes a while before someone starts to think, usually, what about Stalin's fleet? Because if Stalin lives that much longer, he'll get the ships he was pushing for. If he gets the ships he was pushing for, that changes the capacity and capabilities of the Soviet Navy. Which gives them different levers they can pull. Which also requires different responses. It's not just in terms of ships. There's other things he has an impact on. Aircraft. All sorts of areas of Soviet industry are being pushed forward in the face of great opposition by the inertia that is Stalin wants this done. You can be the most powerful, influential general, marshal of the Soviet Union. You can believe that only spending money on the army is of any value. Yet if Stalin wants to spend money on the Navy, on the Air Force, what can you do about it? You can't do anything. So what happens if Stalin lives? Well, it's rather an interesting thing, because, you see, we tend to divide the Cold War up by the leaders on the Soviet side, into the sort of, the beginning, middle, end, and the leadership phases of the Soviets. Stalin is the beginning of the Cold War. The end of World War Two into the begin and the beginning of the Cold War, that is Stalin's area. Stalin's period. Well, if those policies last longer, it gets very, very interesting. There is an argument. Does does or does Russia go bankrupt? Does Russia? What happens? What's the relationship like between Stalin and Mao? That's an interesting one. Because you see. One of the joys Mao has when he's dealing with later Soviet leaders is he claims they don't have enough revolutionary fervor. They weren't revolutionaries. They weren't part of the, the you know, the true believers who brought the communist system into being. You can't have that argument with Stalin. You you can't. 
I don't like the guy. Trust me. There isn't a, a dictator I like in any way, shape, or form. Frankly, it just seems a whole lot of paperwork for the starters, but also they all seem to have abhorrent habits. Not just killing people. You know, killing people is bad enough, yes, but it's the fact that they do it and they also have really nasty habits. It's a case of... I. I just everything goes together. They're just not nice people. And you wouldn't expect them to be. They're dictators, after all. Their clue is in the first three letters of the title. But, still. You'd like to find... You know, whenever you're doing history, and you're reading about people, there's a secret part of every historian who's sort of looking at these people and going, I'd like to find some part of your humanity in there that I can hopefully connect... The readers of this history with so they can understand you and realistically most dictators you in fact or pretty much all dictators you can't you can't and one of the most interesting things about let's be honest the dictator of spain franco is a made-up story in a movie where uh, you know the aunt of one of the characters dated him at one point I said, there go, that's a completely made-up story. Yeah. Still most interesting personality bit about Franco. Shame's book plug. But the big thing here, and what we're talking about, are the last class of battle cruisers under construction. The Stalingrad class. They are the last gunnery battle cruisers. I know there is also the Kirov class, which I've done a video about, which, let's be honest, once you get to that size, you are wondering, but, you know, realistically, they're Alaska class enhanced, so, you know, they're, they're heavy cruisers. But we'll leave that to one side. That's me being a little bit cruel. The Stalingrad class. The plan. The plan, if these were built was that they would form task groups with aircraft carriers and Sveldov class cruisers. Where their guns, those 9, 12-inch guns, 3 or 5 millimeter guns, would provide them with the firepower to drive off Enemy ships. It's a very simple scenario. The idea is you're operating in bad enough weather that your aircraft can't fly off your carrier. If you can't launch aircraft from your carrier, you have these guns. And the idea was that task forces of a carrier, a Stalingrad class, a couple of Svoldbolts, maybe with some escorting destroyers, maybe not, would sail out around the world. They planned to build at least four of these. And when I say plan to build, they had Stalingrad under construction in the Marty Yard, Nikolov. We have Moskova under construction in the Baltic Yard, Leningrad, and Kronstadt under construction in Molsusk. They were laid down in December 1951, September 1952, and October 1952. Stalingrad is launched in March 1954. The thing is, Stalin had died already, and they still hadn't been able to stop Stalingrad class until a year after he dies. There is so much inertia with Project Attachment, they can't stop it for a year after he dies. If you want a good exa another good example of them, there's the Josef Stalin tanks, which... The whole IS family is fun, but the fact is, they keep being built. They keep being built. 
they're not that great. In fact, honestly, they really should have been stopped earlier. But even in 1958, uh, no, 1952, they have the IS-8. Sorry. Getting my tank numbers for I was... The fact is, these tanks with Josef Stalin on them had kept being built. These heavy tanks. And by the way, it takes even longer to stop the turrets, which is why if you go to the Russian-Chinese border to this day, as was actually featured in one of Tom Clancy's books, you can still find concrete pillboxes which are crewed by modern per modern border guards in IS Josef Stalin free tank turrets. So they have the turrets mounted on concrete pillboxes. There are... You know, they had to find a use for them. They couldn't stop their production, so they had to find a use for them. And let's consider this class, because this ship looks mean. It is mean. And it would have been very interesting in terms of what it would have been brought about. With a top speed of 35 and a half knots, they can do good work. They can certainly outpace quite a lot of vessels. Vanguard has a top speed of 30 knots. The Iowa class, well, what were they doing at this time? I suppose they could still still get up to, mm, theoretically, 35 knots in light load, but let's be honest, probably 33 knots, because they would need to have their turbines and everything, uh, their turbines and everything repaired to keep them, uh, to make them able to max speed out. And the thing is, Vanguard's still around. The Iowa class, still around. If these turn up, what do you do? They've got 12-inch guns. There isn't a cruiser out there that can take that thing on. If you want it even more annoying, it's got 7 inches of armour. So your six-inch your tigers with their six-inch automatic guns, no help. Maybe the eight-inch auto heavy cruiser gets renewed life, and maybe that does come into existence. I could see that being an option. But what you have to hope is that no one has the bright a bright idea. And please note, no one know the fourth one hadn't been laid like, down like this yet of making the fourth one nuclear powered. Because that would really cause trouble for the uh, for all the navies. It has an upper deck with two inches of armor. It has a middle deck with two point eight inches of armor. Its turrets have nine point four inches of armor on them. Barbettes are 9.3 inches thick. Secondary turrets have roughly uh, almost an inch. Near enough it makes no difference, an inch of armour. Conning tower, 9.8 inches, and the bulkheads are 5.5 or 4.9 inches thick. And it's fast. Okay, that's not the level of armour or guns, you know, on Vanguard or any of those, but... The thing is, it's designed and capable of doing 35 and a half knots. And the one thing that the Russians tend to be good at is getting speed. And it can do 5,000 nautical miles at 18 knots. This is a ship designed to fight. Designed to escort a carrier. So, 
it suddenly raises a lot of problems for you. Because you can sit there as a Royal Navy Admiral and go, look, sir, we just, ne we just need to keep our carriers. We just need to invest in our carriers and have proper strike aircraft, and we don't care. We've got the Buccaneer. That's being developed to deal with the Svoldov. That will, that's going to be a response to that. Um, I've got a paper on that published on the Global Maritime History. If you want to go see that, you will find it on the, uh, on the papers under the Global Maritime History of me of the small response to the Svoldov class. But leaving that to one side, there are options. They can go, you know, we just had a carry. But the first time one of those vessels turns up in a western port, is sent to visit London, or goes to visit Toulon, or pulls up in New York for a state visit. It's over. The Alaska class, well, they might actually get taken out of, out of whatever kind of mothballing they're in. Because let's be honest, the Alaskas are the closest thing any of the Allies have to these. And if you're going to work out a counter them, you probably want to have your own one so you can figure out how you play it, how it fits into a formation, how you use it. So in Alaska, Alaskas are definitely coming out. Not necessarily to kill it or fight it, although they could do. It could well be that the Alaskas and the Iowas become the cornerstone of the US Navy's fleet efforts, with every group being built around a carrier and either an Iowa or Alaska to provide the heavy escort, just in case the carrier group ba uh, bashes in in wartime to a Russian group. That could well be the short-term solution. Long-term? You've got to factor armour into your missile construction. Nine 12-inch guns, 12 5.1-inch guns in six twin turrets, 24 45mm guns in 6 quadruple mounts, 40 25mm guns in 10 quadruple mounts. 36,500 metric tons. Plus, GIS 2 air search radar. Riff A, surface search radar. Ecker, Zaltfrut B, fire control radars. Grottenstadt B, range finding range, uh, radars. Solsens, infrared detectors. And uh, Gerkel Sonar. Uh, plus, they have uh, Coral and Matcha jammers. It always interests me. When you start talking about these ships, and you start thinking about these ships, what the options are. And this is going to go 20 minutes, isn't it? I'm going to fail again. Uh, what the viability is. Because that's a lot of capability for when we're talking about. We're talking about a ship being built in the 1950s. If you want to compare it to HMS Hood, it doesn't really stack up. But there is no hood in 1950s. Renown, repulsed, they've gone. One sunk, one scrapped. King George V's mostly gone. HMS Vanguard hanging on by her spare teeth, but she can only do 30 knots. This thing can do 35. Which means if you've got a fast carrier, yeah. This can keep up with it. And it can get away from you. It can't get away from aircraft, but it's not supposed to get away from aircraft. This is the beauty. This is the German surface raiding force of the dreams. You have the destroyers formed up around the carrier. 
providing it with its uh, its task of protection. And you have the cruisers, the Svoldovs, and this thing out hunting. Using the information from the carrier. And when bad weather comes in, they close up on the carrier battle group. And it becomes a multi-shelled force that you can't break into. And when it's good weather, they're out. You are talking about what was the confessed nightmare of the Royal Navy. A worked up task group in the North Atlantic. And not just a task group of a capital ship or even a pair of capital ships, but a capital ship with a carrier, which means it can refine and search and find stuff. We're talking about a fully worked up task force. If Stalin got his way, they'd have multiple of them. And then think about the Soviet Union, because if they're starting from that point as the Cold War goes on, if they already have battle cruisers, if they already have carriers, if they already have those task forces, they're not going to abandon them. Yes, they end up focusing everything on submarines, which is really nice. But they soon learn that isn't a sensible path to go down. Gorshkov manages to correct them and gets them back with surface ships. Well, in this scenario, they never go away from surface ships. They have carriers. The Kievs, instead of being their first generation attempt at fixed wing, would be their third generation. The Cold War suddenly gets a lot more expensive and a lot more difficult to manage. Because you want to firm up your com pet communist dictatorship, uh, dictatorship in pick continent, you send the carrier battle group down to say hi. The carrier sits off the coast and aircraft fly around and one of these things goes in and pays a port visit. It's one thing to think about rebelling when they can only say uh, when they they're all they're a distant memory. It's another thing to rebel when there's twelve inch guns staring at you. They're kind of effective negotiators with most attempted rebellions. Because the vast majority of people will think, oh. That gun is larger than my head, by a long way. To give you a rough idea, there you go. I think my finger slightly bent itself. I'm not sure. It shouldn't bend itself, but. I might explain something to do with my shells if it is bent. Anyway. Yeah, this lovely slide roll, roughly the bit above my thumb, roughly 12 inches. Think about that, that's a negotiating tool. And so it would have changed everything. This was a very interesting class, but we should probably be thankful in the West they weren't ever finished, as interesting as it would be, because the complexities and flashpoints they'd have brought about into the world would have made it all very, very different. The Cuban Missile Crisis 
when a carrier battle group with these can turn up. How do you do a blockade? Well, how do you stop something this size, this well armed, armoured, with those missiles maybe strapped to its decks, sailing right through your blockade? Your only way of stopping it is sinking it, and that's definitely going to be a war, but also stopping it's going to require quite a lot of effort. You have a blockade where you have Iowas facing off with these? Or whatever gets built in response. The Super Alaskas. Lord knows what Britain would try and build. You know what? In the. It, I'm sorry, but pre-Suez Crisis, you know we are going to try and build something. And that's the other thing. With these in the world, and possibly a, Suez, uh, a Egypt which looks pro-Russian, that might well change the dynamics as far as the Americans are concerned with the Suez Crisis. It could change, all, have all sorts of consequences going forward for all sorts of policies. You see, it's easy to think of Stalin when we're thinking about him living longer as just the impact of his personality and his decision-making on things. But it's the consequence of those decisions and those projects he pushes through. Those you're going to live with for a lot longer and they are going to shape the world a long time after he's gone. I don't know. Thank you for watching. I think you can guess what today's question is. What do you think happens if Stalin lives longer? What do you think happens if these ships are built? If the carriers are completed? Thank you very much for watching, and I hope you enjoyed. Take care.